Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Easy Equities webinar with CoreShares. I'm your host, Sean Keeling. And thank you to all of you for taking your time out of your day to join us. It's awesome having you all here on the call. Today, we're joined by Chris Rule. Uh, Chris is the Head of Product and Client Solutions at CoreShares Asset Management. And we will be chatting about the new CoreShares Total World ETF. Um, there's, a lot of been, there's been a lot of hype around it, and I'm really interested to hear what about Chris says and find out more about the ETF. It really looks like a good one at this next month, and I'm sure Chris will give us more information uh, about it. It's been said that it's arguably the most comprehensive all-in global strategy that will be listed on the JC. So, it's, uh, like I said, lots of hype, and that's uh, really exciting. On Easy Equities at the moment, we do have it in, in, in an IPO. Um, so, if you like the presentation, like what you have about it, please head over to our new listings tab. So if you go to the menu at the top of our home screen, you can go to the new listing tab and, and, and get in on it right away. Um, there will be a recording of this webinar afterwards. It'll be on the Easy ETFs webinar page. So please check it out there if you want to see it again. And just again, please make sure if you have any questions, please put them in the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. And Chris and I will get to them after the, the presentation. So enough about me talking and over to the, the clever guy in the room, Chris, over to you. And thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Sean, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And big thanks to Easy Equity for hosting us, of course. I'm going to share my screen quickly um, so I can share this presentation. Um, but uh, we are, we're really excited about this new ETF. It's, um, as, as Sean said, it's kind of an extremely comprehensive global fund um, and, and covers all the bases, really. So I, I trust everyone can see my screen. If there are any problems, let me know. No, um, as good, Sean can, all good, Sean? All good, yeah, all good. Perfect. As Sean kindly introduced, um, you know, my name's Chris and, and I represent CoreShares. We're an ETF provider on the JSC. We've got eight ETFs and this is going to be a brand new ETF that we're bringing to the market. It's currently in the IPO phase and Easy Equities has got some cool functionality um, on, their, on their app and on their website where you can actually participate before it lists in the, in the market. But today I'm going to be chatting about this new ETF. Please, as many questions as, as you like, please drop them into Q&A and we'll deal with them after the presentation. Um, but essentially, before we want to jump into the details, before we want to go into some of the, you know, the, the, the finer nuances of this ETF, we want to talk about why South African investors should be looking for offshore investments. Now, probably contrary to a lot of the, the rhetoric that you hear, you know, a lot of the, the commentary that you hear, we're not saying invest offshore because we're hugely pessimistic about the country. We're very positive about South Africa. We're not saying invest offshore because there's so much political risk or government risk or ratings downgrades and so forth. We're saying invest offshore because we need to address this massive problem in most investors' lives, in most people's lives. And that's something called the home bias. Now, home bias sounds quite technical, but if you break it down, basically what it means is that we end up investing most of our money in our home country. Now, that's not a function of us making bad investment decisions a lot of the time. What it actually happens uh, is, is it's a structural challenge for us. Now, the reason why it's a structural challenge is because if you look at your retirement portfolio, for example, which is probably a big part of your savings, that's invested 70% in, in South Africa at, at, at the very least. So, you know, there's regulations that says you can't invest more than 30% offshore. So retirement's a big part of most people's savings, mostly in South Africa. If you own your own apartment or an investment property or, or home, you know, that's a South African based asset. So if you look at your whole portfolio, suddenly you've got your retirement fund, you've got your personal property um, invested in South Africa. Step back even further, you probably work for a South African company. You, you maybe own your own company, which is very related to South Africa and exposed to South Africa. So when you start adding all of these things up, Suddenly, even though you may be doing a monthly debit order into a, a global product and so forth, you see that a lot of your portfolio is sitting in South Africa. So a lot of your exposure north of 70, 80% is in South Africa. Yet South Africa, as a, in terms of the total opportunity set, only represents about half a percent of global stock markets. So half a percent of the global economy is rep represented by South Africa, yet most of us South African investors sit with north of 50, 60, 70%, you know, invested in South Africa. So this is something we call the home bias. Now, those are all the structural reasons. That, those are the reasons why it's hard to have a lot of your portfolio outside of South Africa. Um, behaviorally, there's also a challenge. It's something called familiarity. So we're familiar with brands and we're familiar with businesses, and we tend to invest in those businesses and brands. 
take Woolworths or ShopRite, a classic example. Why do we invest in Woolworths and not invest in, in, in Walmart, for example? Um, you know, that's, that's your classic example. Most likely we invest in those businesses because we're familiar with them. We shop in their shops and so forth. So the bias is further amplified by this behavioral tendency to rather invest in businesses that we're familiar with, as opposed to just best investing in the best global businesses. Now, through ETFs and through platforms like Easy Equities and their global um, platform, you can invest offshore. So what we're saying when we're saying, guess what investors look at a global opportunity is actually from an investment standpoint, there's a good reason why we should be looking to diversify our portfolios and try and get South Africa closer to that 0.5% of our total portfolios, you know, as opposed to sitting up at 70, 80%. The other big thing that people talk about when we talk about global investments is the RAND depreciation. And yes, the RAND does over long periods of time tend to depreciate against hard currencies, US dollars, uh, you know, GBPs, British pounds, the yen, et cetera. Um, but it can be very volatile. So we say, hey guys, just look at the long-term trends. Look at over long periods of time, the RAND depreciating relative to hard currency um, and it will continue to do so. So just to constantly try and get money offshore, to constantly try and get exposure outside of just a pure RAND-based investment makes a lot of sense. Now, I wanna talk about something just very briefly as an anecdote, which is interesting is that over the last five years, guess what? The RAND has been the strongest emerging market currency in the world. And in fact, if you look at a basis relative to the dollar, we're pretty much flat relative to the dollar um, over the last five years. So, you know, to try and time the RAND, there's been a lot of negativity around the RAND in South Africa. But in reality, over the last five years, it's actually been pretty good. So we're not trying to time the markets. We're not trying to say now's a great opportunity. Um, but what we are trying to say is that consistently we should be investing money offshore. We should be looking for offshore investment opportunity. So, you know, we're really excited to bring this kind of product to market. So that's why we should be investing offshore. Um, and, and, and we think there's really good merit in taking money offshore as, as South African investors. The next question is why go passive? Why, <coughs> why pick an ETF, you know? And, and really the, 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 the statistics just consistently tell the same story. The truth is, is that it's extremely difficult to outperform, you know, these indices. And, and this is a statistic that's based on professional money managers. So these are the professional, the big brand money managers that we see and investment houses in the South African market. And it just shows how hard it is to beat a passive investment for a number of reasons. It's low cost, it's very well diversified, um, so on and so forth. But 93% of the South African professional money managers are underperform an index. So you know to have a big portion of your offshore investments in an index, in an ETF, makes a lot of sense. Now, we at Core Shares, we believe in a philosophy called Core Satellite, because, I mean, it is obviously exciting to look at individual shares, um, but we believe you should have a core component, a core holding uh, in, in a global ETF, in a low-cost, hugely diversified global ETF. And by all means, you can stock pick around that, but certainly don't put all of your eggs in one basket. You know, don't bet the house on one share or even 10 shares um, is, is not sufficiently diversified. But we think there's always a great case to invest globally. And further to that, there's always a great case to invest passively in ETFs. So let's talk about the, the new ETF we're bringing to market. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're really excited about it. At Core Shares, we like to bring products that are differentiated in the market. So we don't like to bring products to the market that what we call need to product. So it looks just like another product, but maybe is a bit cheaper or you know, it looks very similar and has a slight nuance. So this new ETF tracks an index that's never been tracked in the market. It's called the FTSE Global All Cap Index, and it is a broad index. And it's broad for, from two perspectives. The one is that it covers both developed and emerging markets. Now I'll talk a bit about the difference between developed and emerging markets. But the other thing that it does, which is very different, is it tracks large caps, mid caps, and small caps. So it covers over 9,000 shares globally which is by far and away the most broad exposure that's available on our market. So having a close look at the investment case of why this is different, why it looks quite a lot different to a lot of the other world ETFs that we've got on the JSC um, and why it should be a good investment. Well, the first thing is that it gives you real economic exposure. So when we talk about the real economy, I'm using the little inverted commas, um, I'm talking about the economy measured by GDP. 
So GDP is a way of measuring essentially a country's revenue. You can think of it like that. Um, and when we look at country revenue, when we look at GDP, and we weight um, the world by country revenue, what we actually find is that about 35% of GDP is driven through emerging markets and 65% of GDP driven through developed markets. Now, a developed market is a market with um, typically a high per capita income, where the average person in the country has a high level of income. Um, they tend to be very developed in terms of their infrastructure um, and, and, and they are post an industrial phase. So, so they tend to be focused on services uh, and, and producing goods and so forth, as opposed to you know, raw materials and, and, and raw commodities and resources. Um, they, they, they tend to be very well regulated countries and they tend to be countries that are very well integrated into global financial systems. So th this is a developed market. Emerging markets, on the other hand, tend to have some of those characteristics, but not all of them. So an emerging market, a classic example would be South Africa. South Africa has got a, 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 fi a financial system second to none, very well regulated, but as an economy, uh, we still have very low per capita income. So our average salary is very low on a global uh, scale, and we are still reliant on um, basic resources and materials. So South Africa would fall into emerging market. Other example of emerging markets are China, Brazil, Russia, India, et cetera, et cetera. So to hold both of these exposures is extremely important because what tends to happen is that emerging economies tend to have high levels of growth. They have high levels of growth, they're coming off a lower base, and they tend to have more tra attractive demographics. They tend to have younger age, uh, age average ages in their population, uh, more consumer-centric uh, uh, economies, as an example. Now, what we see with most global ETFs is that they exclude out emerging markets altogether. So what this ETF is doing is it's bringing both emerging markets and developed markets. Now, emerging markets at the moment in this fund is around 11%. So still a disconnect between the 11 and the 35, but certainly a lot better than zero. Um, and, 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 and one kind of nuance that I do want to talk to is, is how you classify developed and emerging markets. There is some discretion. South Korea is the big one at the moment where there's not a consensus on how it should be developed. If we classify this how most people classify, South Korea would actually be an emerging market, and our emerging markets component would kick up to 13%. Um, so when you're looking at, say, an MSCI-based index, they'll probably, they, well, they do classify South Korea as emerging markets, and then it goes into that 13%. So on a like for like, you can say 13% emerging market. So that's the one key difference, the one great investment proposal of why we should be investing in a, in a fund with, with both emerging and developed markets. And you can see hugely diversified across 49 odd countries, both emerging markets, both the Americas, uh, you know, Middle East and, and, and Asia, um, the, Pacific, the Pacific area and so forth. Um, so a really exciting allocation. And if we look at the breakdown of the country allocation, we can see, you know, your classic kind of world portfolio building blocks. USA is still dominant at 57% of this portfolio. But compared to a typical world ETF, US is more like 65%. So how does it get from 65 down to about 57? Well, it essentially um, uh, is coming from that inclusion of more countries, the inclusion of emerging markets, and the USA weight drops down followed by Japan and then China. China is a little bit of a, a red heron because if we look at China as an example, um, if we include Taiwan, which is a juristic uh, state of, of China and Hong Kong, China exposure actually kicks up to like 9%. So if we look at China through that lens, um, quite a significant allocation to China as the second biggest um, holding. But, but as you can see, hugely diversified across a, a, a large number of, of countries and the rest of the world you can see it's kind of made up by a lot of a lot of the emerging markets, a lot of the developed markets that aren't, aren't quite as, as large. Now, why is it important to hold a basket of countries and not just pick one country? Well, the reality is we, we cannot, with a crystal ball, forecast the outcomes of these particular countries. Perfect example is roll back, say, 30 years, and you'll see the USA sitting at around 35% of this world index, Japan also sitting at close to 35% of this index. So both of those countries were actually pretty much level pegging. Fast forward 30 years, and Japan has had a massive slowdown. Um, they haven't grown nearly as fast as the US. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, if you had picked Japan 30 years ago, 
uh, relative to the USA, that, that would have been a massive mistake. So one of the ways to deal with this risk is to diversify. Now, it seems obvious in hindsight that the US has been the big winner, but remember 30 years ago, Japan was the big winner in terms of automotive uh, production. Uh, it, it, was the it was the most industrialized, the most efficient, hyper efficient economy, extremely wealthy per capita GDP. Um, it was really the global poster child for, 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 for country and for, 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 for you know, uh, an emerging economy. And, and yet the challenges have, have, have in hindsight now been quite obvious. So we believe at the core of your portfolio, you know, the broadly diversified exposure to both countries and of course then sectors. Now at a sector level, this looks quite a lot uh, or, or pretty similar to um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of the other world indices um, with tech uh, dominating at around 21% of the, of the total allocation. So tech sitting at 21% followed by consumer discretionaries, financials, industrials, and, and, and so on and so forth down the tail. So really well diversified. But I guess what's worth highlighting is that at a sector level, you know, when you're looking at um, how many shares make up that 21 exposure, it is, it is it's, it's quite actually um, amazing to see that, say, for in the tech sector, you've got a thousand odd shares making up 21% of your portfolio. I mean, one way to look at that is if you put in 100,000 Rand into this fund, 21,000 Rand effectively goes to the tech sector. And to allocate that 21,000 Rand, you're essentially getting exposure to 1,000 shares. So, you know, it's very well diversified. It diversifies away a lot of the single stock risk, a lot of the single stock exposure that, that typically sits uh, in investors' portfolios when they're trying to invest globally by just simply stock picking. Now, this, this slide is, is kind of my favorite slide, is a bit of an investment geek. This is, and along with the broader emerging markets coverage, this is the second really key point of, of, of differentiation with this fund, which makes it look very different to a lot of the other world ETFs that are coming to the market or that are in the market, uh, in the South African market at the moment, and that it gives you full market coverage. So it doesn't just cover, for example, the 1,600 largest shares, which is what MSCI World does, or the 1,200 largest shares, which is what the S&P Global 1,200 does. It actually covers large caps, mid caps, and small caps. So that means it covers over 9,000 securities, 9,000 shares globally. Now you might think, well, the big guys just dominate the portfolio and the small shares, well, they just make up a tiny bit of the tail, but that's not entirely true. So when we break it down, if you look at a large cap only approach, like, which is what most of the approaches on our market are, that tends to cover about 73% of stock markets globally. So still dominant. Um, mid cap then takes you up to about 88, so the next 15 odd percent. And then when you include small caps, suddenly you get out to 98%. But of this total portfolio, the small cap exposure is sitting at around 10% of the portfolio. The mid cap exposure sits at around 17%. So around 27 odd percent of this portfolio is represented by mid and small cap. Now it's exciting to get exposure to mid and small cap shares because they tend to have high levels of growth and over long periods of time, relative to large cap shares, they tend to outperform. It's quite frightening investing in small cap shares because they tend to be very volatile. It tends to be a lot of risk. Um, and as an investor, it's very difficult to do enough research across this huge tail to know exactly which one to buy. So one way of approaching small and mid caps is to buy a very broadly diversified tail, which is exactly what this fund is offering. So it's offering exposure to small and mid caps without taking on that single stock risk uh, or single stock exposure that is typically associated with small and mid cap investing. So really exciting that you, you know, through this portfolio, are going to get exposure to, you know, small cap China and 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 small cap, uh, you know, uh, Brazil a, as an example, and 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 really from an investment standpoint, that that is a huge differentiator along with the emerging markets uh, component. Top ten holdings, I mean, that's going to look familiar to to most of you guys. The U.S. still dominant in the portfolio, so the top ten port, uh, holdings look a lot like um, any other top ten. I suppose we've got some uh, emerging markets creeping in. Uh, to the top 10, 10 cent. What's worth noting is 10 cents in the portfolio. This is direct 10 cent, the P chip share um, listed in China. So it's not via conduit or, or anything like, uh, like that, like the, 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 the NAS person and the process holding. So kind of standard top 10. So to recap, why is this fund different? Well, it gives you 
a, a, a nice exposure to the real economy. Um, it's hugely uh, diversified from a geographic exposure across 49 odd countries, um, covering all of developed and emerging markets. And then it includes small, mid and large caps. So you're getting, essentially you're buying the whole, whole stock market in, in, in one go. Essentially what you're getting is all of this. And then what we're excited about and really the cherry on the top is that we're targeting a TER of 0.29% um, and, and that would make it the most cost efficient global uh, ETF in, in our market. So a little commercial case, just to compare it to the different competitor ETFs on the JSC, um, what we can see here is, is, is exactly what I mentioned. You're essentially getting far more shares across far more countries with a higher weight in emerging markets um, and, and all of that's wrapped up at 0.29%. So we are super excited about this ETF. Um, we think it's gonna add a lot of value to clients' portfolios. We think this should be like a core holding. You know, This should be one of the staples in your portfolio that you can invest and forget and keep investing and keep forgetting about this portfolio over 20, 30, 50 years. You know, this, is, this is what this portfolio is all about. So thank you for your time. I will open up and look at the questions now. Um, Sean, if you want to jump in and, and, and add anything, please don't hesitate. And I will be um, uh, yeah, in touch. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. That was a really insightful presentation. I particularly like the point about how um, this moves from 65% um, US holdings to 57 compared to the, the, other, the other ETFs that have... Uh, uh, world uh, world holdings and the, and the TER um, at, at such a low cost of 29, 0.29, which is amazing. Um, I just wanted to, before you get into the questions, Chris, I just would like, I just want to know if you can just touch on why, why it would be important maybe to jump in on, on, on the IPO in this before it lists and, and what your listing date for this ETF will be. So so let me yeah talk a little bit about that before I um, um, jump to the questions. IPO is an initial public offering. It gives investors the opportunity to invest um, you know, into, into this ETF without paying any, any brokerage. Um, and, and so is you know, a, a nice opportunity to save some costs. You also won't pay the typical spreads on an ETF. Um, and, and we're currently in IPO phase until the 7th of May. Um, the ETF will list on the 17th of May um, and be trading on the JC just like your kind of any other any other ETF um, that exists in the in the portfolio, so so um, you know there's an opportunity through Easy Equities, for example, to please um, you know to participate in the IPO, save something on brokerage and costs, and get this exposure uh, into your portfolio. Essentially, how it works is you pay money to Easy Equities, they move it to our custodian, we go and buy the underlying shares, we hold the exposure, and we convert those 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 IPO um, letters of allotment that you participated in. To, into ETF shares. Does that cover that, Sean? Are you, are you happy with that, everyone? Awesome, yeah, thanks, Chris. And just uh, saw a couple of questions there. The, the ETF is available in your ZAR and your TFSA account also, which is a great one that it's also available in your TFSA account. Yeah, so thanks, Chris, over to you and the questions. Perfect, thank you, Sean. So um, <clears throat> I'm gonna just start from the top. Um, with so many companies, um, is this not a case for over-diversification? So it's a good question. I mean, a lot of people talk about over-diversification. I think it often comes from a point of, 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 of um, listening to, you know, uh, the kind of rhetoric in the market. I mean, what diversification represents is it represents the same level of return at a reduced level of risk. So the idea that over-diversification drops down your, your level of, of return is, is simply not true. What it does do is by diversifying as much as possible, um, you, do, you do reduce your risk. So you improve your risk adjusted return. So absolutely not. This is not a, a case of, of over diversification. In fact, with the inclusion of mid and small caps and emerging markets, which make up a large you know, tail of those extra shares, you're actually getting extra return drivers. So you're getting that small cap uh, premium, you're getting that size, size premium, which is referenced in investment um, uh, in, in investment world, um, and you're getting exposure to those emerging growth economies. So absolutely not a case of, of over-diversification. I'm uh, being asked here, how does it differ to the Satrix World, for example? Satrix World tracks uh, an MSCI World Index. So I'm going to talk to the index differences. The MSCI World Index 
covers about 1,600 shares, and it's only in developed markets. So it doesn't include any emerging markets, and, and it doesn't include small cap. So, so it's, it's, it is quite a different portfolio. It looks quite different. Um, this is a broader exposure with, with emerging markets and, and, and with small and mid caps. Hi, please. Um, um, the, the cost of holding this ETF. So the targeted TER um, um, is 0.29%. That includes all of the costs. So um, this, this fund is structured as a, um, <clears throat> as a feeder fund, we go and buy um, underlying, underlying, uh, uh, the, the underlying fund, and that fund cost is included in our cost. Um, so that includes all of the costs of, of holding this ETF. There, of course, are costs in terms of investing by easy equities. Um, th that cost um, absolutely exists in the um, you, you know, in your, in, your, in your world as an investor, and you would need to consider that, but that doesn't come into your holding costs. As far as I know, Easy Equities doesn't have any monthly charge or minimum charge. It's just an upfront straightforward brokes of 0.25% and then off you go. Correct. Okay, next question. There's quite a lot of questions. So I'm just gonna try to go through them as kind of orderly as possible. Um, do we need to deposit money in, which EA account? I think Sean, I'll get you to respond to the Easy Equities account if you if you made a question is asking about how we deposit money into an Easy Equities account before we um, before we uh, yeah. uh, participate. Well, sure, Chris. So, so that question, I think you're looking at for the for the IPO. Yes, you would need to deposit money beforehand into your account. If you want it in your TFSA account, you'd have to do it in your TFSA or your ZAR into your ZAR, and then to find the IPO. You go to the menu bar at the top of your top left of your screen, you click on the menu bar and under my investment, there's a new listings tab. That's where you'll be able to get to the IPO for, uh, from. 100%. So next question is, if we say US shares are 1775 in this ETF, does that mean that different companies are invested in from the USA? It, it means that in the USA, there are 1,775 shares that make up the USA exposure. So it's not just like the S&P 500, includes their mid and small cap uh, exposures. How are you able to ensure that TER is only 0.04 higher than your S&P 50 ETF? Um, we, we ensure that we can manage that TER by using a feeder fund structure. So that's really efficient. Um, and, and our management fee is actually only 0.15%. So even though the TER is gonna be a bit higher, the um, the management fee is low at 0.15%. Uh, Sean, there's a question about um, currencies and the fees relating to um, depositing, depositing currencies. Um, so uh, I don't know if you want to touch on that from Anele, um, but, but if you want me to carry on, let me know and I will. Few Very questions on, about on, the, TR. the TR is going to be targeted 0.29%. Carry on, Chris. I'll answer that one properly. Sure. Are these ETFs under uh, uh, USA Easy Equities? No, these would be JSC listed, this ETF. So this ETF would actually trade on the JSC. Um, excuse me for leading forward. Is there a minimum or maximum for the IPO? We don't have any minimums. I'm not sure if Easy Equities does, but we'll accept one round if, 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 if invested. Um, so, so no minimums uh, from our side. No minimums from us either. I think if um, there's a question about the IPO and Easy Equities, I think if you go to the IPO page at the moment, it is the only IPO, so you can't really miss it. It's, a, it's And it's under core shares. That's correct. So the market maker for this fund is Sunlum. Um, um, the spreads, uh, well, we've got both Sunlum and, and an offshore market maker coming in, but Sunlum is the official market maker. The spread will depend on the time of day and the spread will depend on how liquid the underlying market is because the underlying is so liquid um, and so heavily traded, we expect the spreads to be ex <coughs> extremely competitive. Um, it's, it's hard to give an exact number because it really does depend on currency volatility, underlying volatility and so forth. But if you look at the average spreads on the JSC, they sit at around 1% in the global um, in the global ETFs um, or, or 0.5 either way. So, so in, in that, certainly in that region. 
We haven't got a, a, an ETF price yet. We will announce the conversion ratio um, on the 13th of May. Um, there's a question, I'm not sure I understand it. Um, it asks what the risk ratio is when hedged, pros, cons. Um, if you could elaborate on that, I can come back to you. How are you able to have such a small TER with such wide exposure? It's the structure that we're using, this feeder fund structure where we, we were able to find a hyper efficient uh, portfolio. Um, the difference between this and the, the Global 1200 ETF, Global 1200 obviously only covers 1200 shares. So it's only large cap, it doesn't hold mid and small cap. It does hold some emerging markets, but not quite as broad. And one of the slides that I have um, is, is indicative, uh, it will indicate all the differences in number of countries. Um, the global 1200 um, emerging markets component is around 5%. So it is, it is the only ETF on the, at the JC on the moment, the global 1200, which has emerging markets. It sits at 5% if you classify South Korea as developed. Seven, if you classify it as emerging, our ETF will be at 11 or 13, depending on how you classify that. Um, to buy the ETF, you can either participate in the IPO or once it's listed on the 17th of May, you are more than welcome um, to, to, to invest. Why would you buy this instead of Vanguard's VT in your US account? I mean, good question. When you're investing offshore, you need to consider the brokerage rates you're paying offshore. You need to consider your currency spreads. There was a question about currency. Retail investors, they tend to pay a very wide spread on currency. So let's say the RAND's trading at 15. You might only be buying dollars at 15 Rand 50, for example. So, you know, why would you consider this over that? Is it tends to be efficient. Other things like it's available in your tax free wrapper, uh, but it's not available in your tax free wrapper, obviously, if your money's offshore. Um, Etc. So, so there's good reasons as to why, but you need to consider the whole value chain um, when you're making a decision on BT over, over this ETF. Okay, I think I've answered most of these other questions. Um, I've answered the fees questions. Is investing in ETFs for money or is it for fun? It depends who you ask. Um, you, I, I think it's for both because I, I get excited about investments in ETFs. So for me, it's to make some money. It's to invest long-term returns, uh, inflation-beating returns, to build wealth. But also, I have a lot of fun investing in ETFs. So, so it, it can be for both. Nice question. Can we buy this before it's listed? Yes, you can buy it on the IPO. Some questions for Sean. Uh, one more question here. So there's a question saying, um, would you add more emerging markets through China or an emerging market 50? Um, I'm not familiar with that exact fund, but, but I'm, I'm getting a, an idea of what it is. Um, or the top 40. Um, I mean, look, that's where this whole thing, of course, satellite comes to play. I mean, I would hold a total global portfolio as like the, the main part of my portfolio. If you want to like supercharge it with some emerging markets, then you've got to make a take a view. So, so your starting point would then be that broad emerging markets basket, which is like China, Russia, India, Brazil, South Africa is included there. So you've asked about top 40. Um, and do you have particular conviction around one country over the other? very difficult to predict, but, but you as an investor may have done your homework and done all this kind of stuff and, and you can come up with one. The top 40, the South African market's an interesting one because it's a, we've got a, this funny kind of hybrid market where um, our market sort of is, from a listed equities perspective, looks a bit like half developed, half emerging. We've got a number of shares that look like developed market stocks, British American tobacco, now typically the dual listed, British American tobacco, a lot of some of our mining bosses, um, uh, et cetera. So, so those look and behave a little bit like developed market stocks. And then we've got like very emerging markets components. So some of the gold shares and the platinum shares and uh, Nashpers, which obviously references in the main 10 cent, which is Chinese listed. Um, so we've got this kind of hybrid market um, and it doesn't necessarily have a very high level of correlation with the emerging markets because of some of those disconnects. 
Um, but what does have a high level of correlation with the emerging markets is our currency. So the RAND is very much an emerging markets currency. So, you know, when you're picking a particular emerging market, all I would say is, you know, do your homework, understand what, what kind of bets you're taking and, and don't put all your eggs in one basket. I mean, that Japan and USA trend that I showed earlier was, was is something quite staggering over the long, long period of time. Uh, so a question about the top 10 holdings. There was a slide on it. Um, so we'll share the slides and you can have a look at that. Highest weight sitting just around 3%. Um, the total, total top 10 combined sits at around 12%, 11, 12%. Contrast that with an MSCI world approach, the top 10 sits around 16, 17%. So yes, 10, 12% is quite high for a top 10, but it's, it's lower than just a developed market uh, world approach only. They're an advantage of buying the IPO versus after release. The big, the big advantage is you don't pay brokerage if you participate in the IPO. And, and then uh, in addition, you don't pay the spread. So the advantage for, for an investor is you get that, that little bit of saving and, and hey, you know, really why not save the money when, if, if you're gonna make an investment anyway. So I, I would be a big uh, um, you know, fan of investing in an IPO just because there's a little bit of savings to be had. I think that covers the IPO question. So the deadline to take advantage of the IPO is the 7th of May, but please get your applications in through Easy Equities before then, because Easy Equity, that's the deadline actually for Easy Equities, not for you guys, the investors. So Easy Equities might have a different deadline. You know, they, get your kind of applications in as soon as possible, just to make, just to make, um, uh, take advantage. Is there a guaranteed advantage? Well, yes, there is that brokerage is guaranteed you know, that you don't pay. So, so yeah, that is guaranteed. It's not like an IPO of a share where you might be buying a share at a discount, um, for example. Um, but, but, but you know, we when this list, it's going to list at the at the IPO. Another question asking about being invested in a, an emerging market, already invested in a MSCI emerging markets ETF and an MSCI world ETF. What does your ETF give me that these two don't? The big thing is that small and mid cap. So when you take the, the emerging markets and you combine it with the, with the MSCI world, um, you get to a geographic exposure that looks quite similar, depending on how you weight them. Um, but what you don't get is that very long tail of mid and small cap exposure, which is quite exciting from an investment standpoint and quite a nice return driver to hold um, in your portfolio. The other thing is that you're only buying one fund. So in terms of rebalance, uh, friction, and so forth, it, it is a more efficient allocation, regardless of, 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 of how you weight it. The benefit of holding EM and world is you might want to choose your own weights. You might want to say, I actually want to weight world and emerging markets equally. You can't do that, obviously, if you're buying our ETF, then you're just holding the whole basket. Again, that's where I'd encourage you guys to have a look at a course at light um, uh, approach. As this ETF is a new one, balanced develop in developing countries, will it be good for long or short-term investment? Great question. This is absolutely a long-term investment opportunity. Um, the underlying assets are shares. Now, all shares should be long-term investments. Shares are very variable. You're taking on a lot of risk, but for that long-term long -term, uh, uh, reward. So absolutely long-term. I, I would certainly not um, uh, recommend using this as a short-term investment. Please explain what a feeder fund is. Feeder fund is our fund simply goes and buys another fund. Um, and that fund then goes and buys all the underlying shares. So when we're talking about the shares, we're talking about the index we track. And then we're talking about the, the effective shares that you hold through the feeder fund structure. What is the, the, uh, the regionals for excluding Africa as an emerging market? So um, <clears throat> there is African exposure in this fund. Um, most of the African markets tend to be what's known as a frontier market. Now, frontier markets look quite a lot like emerging markets, but they tend to have a few of these things. They tend to be unregulated or have very weak or lax regulation. Um, so not a lot of investor protection. They tend to be very difficult to invest and disinvest. So they tend to be illiquid. Um, Nigeria is a perfect example. You know, if you invested in the Nigerian markets, very difficult to actually to get your money out physically to, to, to realize your investments. So frontier markets tend to be 
Um, uh, also, very low levels of, of, of per capita um, uh, income, and 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 they tend to be um, you know uh, less industrialized, lower levels of infrastructure, both physical infrastructure, um, and financial services infrastructure, and regulatory infrastructure. So, they are riskier investments. Um, and very difficult to get your min money in and out. And that's why they're typically excluded from global equity approaches. Uh, there are dividend payouts, great question. Um, and they are twice a year. So March and September is the dividend um, payout. Okay. There's a few questions about easy equity, Sean. I'll let you take over. I've been answering them as we go, Chris. So you just keep going and I'll just keep writing those ones out. Perfect, perfect. So how does the total approach perform against S&P 500 over the last three or five years? The US as a market has been the big growth market. It's been where all the performance out of global indices has come in general. So the S&P 500 over the last three and five years has outperformed this. The question is going forward where, whether it will continue to outperform or whether maybe, um, say, China will outperform or so on and so forth. So it's less a question about this, this, this particular ETF. It's not a question about um, holding a particular country. It's about diversifying your exposure um, and, ho and holding that exposure. Now, this, this fund has performed you know, very well in RAND terms, certainly, and in dollar terms over the last three to five years. Um, the U.S. Has, market has just been the global, the global leader. So it's, it's not to say that the performance has not been good. Is South Africa included in this ETF under emerging markets? It is. That's a great question. The, the, the South African exposure is around 0.4%. <clears throat> so it's a very small exposure in the portfolio. Um, and, and yeah, when you're looking at your total portfolio, just remember about 0.4%, you put in a 100,000 Rand, 400 Rand is in South Africa. So it's, it's a low amount, but it's still there. So it says here, surely the feeder funds would have their own costs. So the actual cost will be above 0.29%. Um, incorrect. Um, the 0.29% includes the whole thing. So the feeders fund, the underlying fund, the fund structure in South Africa, the audit bill, the custody bill, the trustee bill, that, that's an all-inclusive bill. The one thing it excludes, because you guys will be familiar, you've got the TER and then you've got the TIC. The TIC includes the transaction costs. So that's what uh, the TC uh, is the transaction cost. So TIC comes over and above the TER. We're expecting that to be very low. I mean, to give you an example, our S&P 500, which is also a feeder fund, has a zero TC. So you know, the reason why it's so low is because we're only buying one fund, we're only buying one security when we're investing. So, um, you know, um, really low TC uh, should come out, but it's very difficult to predict. That's why we're not giving a forecast. TER, we can control quite nicely as a business, uh, you know, right down to the kind of nth degree. So we, we, we're quite comfortable publishing what's called targeted TER. Question about what ETF would you recommend us to look at? I mean, that's a kind of a hugely open-ended question. I think, um, you know, more specifics um, to get to that. Yes, you would get the opportunity to see exactly which ETF shares the ETF is invested in. Absolutely, that will be on our website. Would you say the ETF factors in size, giving the wide coverage? Would you say more factored global perhaps including value i'm not sure i entirely understand the question I'm, I'm going to say it does take size in as a factor of course it's market cap weighted strategy so that means that the biggest companies get the biggest weight but because we've got mid and small companies they're also included in the portfolio the small and mid companies make up about 27 percent of the portfolio so relatively large weight there's another question around value. I mean, value is a different investment strategy altogether. That's almost a topic on its own regard. This is not a value strategy. This is a market cap weighted strategy. If a company is global, how, would, how does the fund differentiate between mid, large, mid and large and geographic area? So it looks at the, the, the primary listing. So where a company is primary listed is where it is allocated from, from a geographic perspective. 
Um, and then the size depends on liquidity. It depends on how big the company is and so on and so forth. How do I diversify my portfolio in terms of this? Well, I mean, if you just hold this one ETF, you're really well diversified. Why bring this to South Africa? Well, bring it to South Africa because then it's available to South African investors. There are a lot of, as I mentioned, like tax-free savings accounts, for example, where you can't invest in offshore portfolios. As a retail investor, you're not buying currency, paying currency spreads. And, and I'm gonna warn you guys again about currency spreads. They are huge and you don't see them because it doesn't come through in a cost, an explicit cost. So, you know, when you're going offshore, just consider currency spreads. Another question, a repetitive question about owning a world ETF and an emerging market ETF. What's the difference in this? The big difference is you get small and mid caps in this and a longer tail. Uh, is it fair to say this is not smart beta? Yes, this is not smart beta. This is kind of simple market cap weighted core allocation. If an American economy went down and became a developing market um, or emerging markets over the next five years and South Africa becomes a developed market, does, does the fund shift to accommodate these world standards? Well, the classification may change. It's very unlikely that these class classifications don't change very quickly. You can understand for the US to become a, an emerging market overnight would mean an absolute fallout in their infrastructure, in their financial system, um, and not a crash, literally a breakdown in regulation, um, et cetera. So it would be very unlikely. What's more likely is emerging markets becoming developed markets. The reality is that, is that as an emerging market becomes a developed market, let's say China becomes a developed market, um, it would just simply be a change of classification. So you'd still hold the Chinese exposure in the fund. It just means that you are holding it in the developed market basket. And the weights, that 13% weight will change over time. So, so you know, that's going to change. The emerging market component could get bigger or smaller, et cetera. Another question about if the ETF is, is available, um, it's an IPO phase, so it's available, but via an IPO. Um, and then it lists on the 17th of May when you can buy it like a normal share. So for now, the way you participate is to participate by Easy Equities' uh, IPO um, uh, functionality, and then um, you pay money across, and then you're gonna get the ETFs into your portfolio on the 17th of May without trading it in the market. Um, on the 17th of May and onwards, it will trade in the market like a normal share. I think, I think I've answered all the questions, but please fire, keep firing away. I will um, stay online. Sean, I don't know if you want to jump in. I mean, once again, a big thank you to everyone for listening and, and joining us and for all the great questions. Um, if you've got any more questions, don't hesitate to drop us a line at info at cautions.co.za. Um, or if they're you know, easy equities related questions, um, please um, drop, us, drop us a line. As I said, you know, why we're excited about this ETF, just to recap, we're excited because you know, for the first time on the JC, you're getting a nice substantial com uh, component of emerging markets. Emerging markets are these growth economies um, with very attractive fundamentals. Um, and then you're getting exposure to small and mid cap for the first time. And that makes up a large part of the portfolio, 27%. And these small shares tend to be good return drivers over long periods of time. So those two reasons are the key differentiators relative to any other ETF on this market. Um, and all of this is, is, is at a cost leadership angle at 0.29%. We, we, we think that cost is just a cherry on the top. It's not, it's not the be all and end all, but guess what? You know, it, is, it is a cost leader. Great. Thanks so much, Chris. I think you did a, a really good session of rapid fire questions there ask, on answering everyone. And it was, as someone has just said, that was very informative. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this one to list. I will definitely be one of the guys getting in on the IPO. And um, so I think we're going to end it there because, I mean, I see some more questions coming, but a lot of them are just repetitive of the ones we've had. So to all of those people that are asking, the session is being recorded as well as I will get Chris's presentation from him. And it will be uh, available on the Easy ETFs webinar page. Um, we will be sending out mailers and some social stuff about the IPO. We can also get in it through the um, if you find out how where to get it. Is it on our new listings tab 
on Easy Equity. So it's under the menu, uh, My Investments, New Listings tab under TFSA and so on. But again, thank you to all of us for joining today. And thank you so much to you, Chris and Korshia for bringing this uh, product to the market and for taking your time on the day to explain it to us. Absolute pleasure, Sean, and thank, thanks for your time.